All right, if we can go ahead and get started, Steve's going to give us, talk to us about Railroad Radio Communications. All right, Steve. Appreciate it. So uh, give myself a little more of, a, of an introduction. Uh, my name's Stephen Hamilton, and I've been a model railroader my entire life, trained up. Uh, since I was probably inside my mom's belly, she said every time she came to a railroad crossing and the train was going by, I must have been doing this in the belly. So, uh, so I've all trained my whole life, and as a teenager, uh, I was rail fanning with a friend at Rochelle Railroad Park, if anybody's ever been there. Uh, tremendous place to, uh, to see trains going by. And as anybody may have known, if you uh, are rail fanning, you may use a police scanner type radio device. You can hear the trains talking to dispatchers or to each other, and it kind of gives you an idea of what's going on. So my friend and I, we are um, rail fanning in this railroad park, and we've got our little scanner with us, and we're doing our best to hear what's going on, and it's staticky and scratchy. And there's a gentleman right next to us hearing the exact same thing, crystal clear, hearing stuff that I can't even hear. This intrigued me. Uh, why is one radio better than the other? So that led me into amateur radio. Now, I know a lot of model writers who also are um, in the amateur radio hobby as well. So it must be uh, you know, something technical that comes with that. And uh, so, I mean, I enjoy both aspects of those hobbies, uh, model rarity, rarity, and uh, radio type technology things too. So there's my email address. If uh, anybody has any questions they think of after the fact, feel free to email me. Uh, it's a picture of me inside the E8 locomotive down in Jackson, Missouri, the um, uh, Penzi E8. I was a volunteer there for, uh, for a while. And uh, being a radio geek, I guess, uh, I got kind of thrown into taking care of the radio stuff. So I'm working on the uh, locomotive radio inside the E8 there. And uh, anyway, so radio, when we think of radio, uh, it's all part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And that includes your x-rays and your gamma rays and your infrared light and all of that stuff. Well, PC to blue light. Yeah. <laughs> and so at the lower end of that is where we get our uh, radio frequency waves and we can uh, harness those and uh, modulate with information and send it wirelessly over uh, incredible distances. So uh, if you're not familiar with radio devices, I mean, I think everybody here has a cell phone. That's essentially a radio. It's just a really sophisticated radio. Baby monitors, radios, your microwaves that heat up your frozen pizza. That's a radio. It's just focusing the energy towards the, the food. Um, remote controls uh, use the infrared, which is in the electromagnetic spectrum. So we have a, a lot of different things, devices that we use daily that are wireless technology. We don't really realize that, you know, because it's something we just use every day. We take for granted. <coughs> Um, and so as you can see, at the lower end, uh, we, we measure wavelengths physically, we can phys if we can see them, they're invisible. Uh, the lower end of that, they're tremendously big, I mean they are uh, hundreds of meters in size. And then as we go up towards our microwaves, our infrared, and our gamma rays, they get significantly smaller, um, depending upon you know, where they are in the spectrum. Uh, so we, you know, radio, um, there's a name if you want to research that a little more, that's uh, just one that I pulled off of Google, uh, you know, used a prism to separate uh, light spectrum and it used a thermometer to see that there's a, a difference in temperature with the different lights and that put it on a, a scale or a spectrum. So that was around 1800 when we start looking at some of the technology starting to develop into what we have today. Uh, electromagnetism, it was linked to that by 1845 by uh, Michael Faraday. And then there's a name you may recognize, is uh, Heinrich Hertz built uh, a piece of equipment that he was able to generate um, and detect radio waves. Now, when we think of uh, computer processors, we say, oh, that's a 10 gigahertz processor, uh, 1300 kilohertz. You know, we hear that Hertz, and that's because uh, his name was appended to that. So, moving on from radio, where they were developing uh, radio equipment and antennas and uh, apparatus to uh, send wireless information, that was in the mid to late 1800s that we were starting to develop a lot of this wireless technology. Um, and by 1900, we had usable radio equipment, AM broadcast and uh, wireless telegraph. So now, in the 1830s neighborhood, Samuel Morse, if you know that name, Morse Code, uh, organized a, um, or I guess invented, uh, with the help of some assistants, the Morse Code system, using uh, 
two lengths of dits and daws, or dots and dashes, that uh, when arranged together in a group could be sent over telegraph wires and, uh, you know, as, as letters, letters and numbers, and the person receiving that on the other end could write that down and be able to make out the information. The problem with telegraph was it went over wire. So if there was um, sabotage and they cut the wires, then you couldn't send any messages. Uh, storm damage and things of that nature. And some of these wires went through pretty remote locations um, that uh, made it hard to maintain those wires. So it was at the expense of the copper and everything. Uh, telegraph, that was tested in uh, London on the London and Birmingham Railway in 1837. Uh, let's see, there's the picture. And so when we get out there in the wilderness, I mean, not only is that a, a lot of money <coughs> building and maintaining that, but it's difficult to access when it does break. And that's why, uh, you know, they stuck with the telegraph for a while. Does anybody use timetable and train order on their model railroads? Uh, you would have a, um, an operator and a dispatcher, and he would, in the early era of railroading, send that information over the line side wires to the stations, and then they would give the orders up to the um, trains as they went by that station. They usually had a, a semaphore for a train order board out there and let the approaching trains know if they needed to stop and get um, any new orders. And uh, then as, as technology progressed, then we got into uh, telephone systems. So we had telegraph, and that required an operator who was proficient in Morse code. And then uh, when we got telephone, it was just a matter of picking up. But it was still the dispatcher talking to the station operators, the agents. They were never actually talking to the trains themselves. Uh, in the early 1930s, give or take, Pennsylvania Railroad uh, tried out an inductance phone. So basically that was a telephone-like device that was mounted on the locomotive and the caboose. And if, uh, let's see if I got a picture. I had a picture. There's a picture. Uh, if you model the Pennsy Railroad and you see the uh, handrail looking thing on top of the locomotive and there may have been on the steam engine as well or the uh, caboose in the back. Uh, that's actually the inductance phone antenna and it would either couple with the rails and the rails would be energized with the phone signal to transmit to the, um, the dispatcher or more likely the white line side wires that were parallel to the train tracks. They used a form of inductance coupling and anybody that's read any DCC uh, technical books they say, uh, you know, be careful about having your bus wires perfectly parallel at a particular dif distance as you go around the lamp because it may uh, disrupt the uh, DCC signal on your, uh, on your bus lines. And the, some of them say twisting may help, and I go with uh, keeping them as far apart as possible. Then there's no coupling. It's the AC signal that's coupling there. I'm going back to it. Uh, and that really, oops, where did I push? Okay. Uh, Penzi mainly used that. There was... I read that Kansas City Southern tried it as well as uh, DMIR up in Minnesota to some extent. Uh, before really, uh, radio was the um, easier way to go because uh, it didn't require the inductance infrastructure and it wasn't as prone to interference. So that was phased out, my understanding, sometime in the 60s. Uh, wireless radio, now we've been using wireless radio for the early 1900s, and the military used it extensively, especially in World War II. Uh, you know, the soldiers would carry backpack radios. So wire wireless technology, voice communications was already there, but the railroads hadn't adopted it yet because they already had their uh, station agents and the telegraph wires were already installed, so that was already working. That started to come in favor of uh, locomotives. I've seen a lot of pictures in the 50s where locomotives started to uh, uh, be delivered with uh, radio equipment, and a lot of that was uh, uh, bulky uh, vacuum tube type transmitters. So they were prone to being broken. Uh, let's see, it's <coughs> B&L was always a front runner with uh, railroad technology, and uh, in 1932 they transmitted a radio signal from a moving train to show, I guess, that it had some feasibility in the world of railroading. And like I said, it started becoming common in the 1950s, but you still didn't see uh, train crews like we see today where the conductors have a portable radio and uh, everything's got a radio in it nowadays, high rail trucks, uh, maintenance equipment. Back then it was really just uh, 
uh, forgot the word I was going to say, Prim primarily focused on the locomotives and the cabooses uh, and the dispatcher and the station offices. And then I've got some things to show off here. Uh, towards the 60s and 70s, portable equipment that was heavy duty enough for railroading came into play. And this is called a lunchbox radio. Uh, this one was issued to a Southern Railway uh, crew member. And he would carry this around the yard with him, and that was his portable radio. I mean, imagine carrying this today. It's heavy. They already got all this other equipment they got to carry with them, too. Uh, that was the uh, model. was the PT500. Motorola made that. And uh, they also made kind of a little brother uh, MT500. So this made it a little bit easier, but the battery was, of course, you know, much more limited than what you had here, so you'd end up changing batteries a lot with that. The other advantage to this one was a lot of cabooses towards the 70s had a mounting holster up there and they could disconnect the antenna, connect it out to the antenna on the roof of the caboose and uh, be able to, you know, talk to their engineer, or the dispatcher, and what other cabooses <coughs> they had part of their part of their train. Uh, so some of today's uses on radio equipment, um, track warrants, you have the train crew that's able to communicate directly with the dispatcher now, and that uh, pretty well spelled the end of tra uh, train order uh, timetable use, because now the trains could communicate directly to the dispatchers themselves, dispatchers sometimes being hundreds of miles away. Um, and you'll see if you are rail fanning ever and look at uh, photographs of any main lines that you're modeling, uh, uh, periodically every 20 to 30 miles, a uh, very large 200 to 300 foot antenna tower. And the dispatcher, say the Union Pacific dispatcher in Omaha, is able to connect with every individual tower across the system from Omaha. And it's done through uh, satellite and microwave links. And he can just call up a particular tower. And now his voice is going to come out of that radio tower to whatever train happens to be nearby. Uh, and also with uh, you know the advent of portable communications, you see less of whistle signals and hand signals and more of them just talking, hey, come back here. <laughs> uh, the other thing that today's railroads use on uh, wireless communications is the EOT telemetry. That's the end of train device. It's a little red light that hangs on the back of the train cars that replace the cabooses, sadly. And uh, that's done over the radio spectrum. It transmits uh, telemetry telemetry data such as air, um, air pipe pressure on the brake line as well as whether or not the rear end of the train is moving and it, uh, the engineer has an ability to control it uh, in the event of an emergency air brake application he can set the emergency brakes on the rear end of the train to be in the middle stop the train a lot quicker so that's the antenna that would be on top of the locomotive that you would see specifically for the uh, EOT device that's on the back of the, uh, the train. Uh, another use that uh, the railroads are seeing a lot more of with uh, radio signals is positive train control, PTC. Now this will be an antenna that's also next to the tracks, typically found at signal locations. Uh, I, I have a picture, but it was at the beginning. I'll go back to it later. And it's usually a monopole, 40, 50 feet tall, and it's got two small little loops on it, those are the antennas, mounted on top of the monopole. So that'd be really easy to model if you're a contemporary modeler of today's railroads. Uh, a couple pieces of styrene and some brass, uh, brass rod, and you could shape into those loops. Uh, you'll see some of the models today coming out from manufacturers. That's actually a scale trains, Dash 9. Uh, it was on display at the uh, rail prototype modelers meet last month. And uh, we can see a lot of the antenna equipment that would be on top of a typical locomotive. Uh, these antennas back here would be used for the new PTC technology that's coming out. Uh, these little domes would be for cellular technology for the computer system. And then this is the uh, antenna for the VHF voice radio system. And I have one of those right here. And everything in railroading is heavy. I was told by a friend of mine who's a railroader, if it's not heavy, it's not made for the railroad. And so that'd be the antenna that's physically on top of that locomotive, um, they were meant, they were designed and manufactured to survive a derailment and still work. So. 
another piece of equipment that you normally see on top of older locomotives, which isn't pictured there, but an older locomotive antenna would be one of these called a firecracker antenna. I believe that uh, Details West makes these in HO scale. Um, and a lot of times your models will even come with them from the, the manufacturer. And then through handling and everything, they usually get bent because they're sticking up and they're really small and fragile detail parts. But these things got hit by trees all the time and bent. So if it's bent on your model, it's perfectly prototypical. <laughs> <laughs> when did they start using the firecracker antenna? Okay, so I know that Motorola came out with their own version. I do not know if I have an antenna specialist or Motorola because the, uh, the serial number is not on there anymore. Um, I think antenna specialists came out with theirs in the late 50s. What they used before that probably was a whip type antenna. And then, uh, you know, these are uh, just a quarter wave helical. Um, so the entire antenna is actually contained inside the dome there. And uh, they started getting phased out for this. This is called, so that being the firecracker antenna, because it looks like firecracker. And then this being an ice skate antenna, because it looks like an ice skate. And one's made by Sinclair, and one primarily made by Motorola, but also antenna specialists. These are what's in favor today, because they don't get whacked by the trees so much. Um, although they don't work as good as these, but to the railroads it doesn't matter, because they've got base stations every 20 miles. So their, their goal is not really to have the ultimate in range, as it is um, maintenance and <laughs> serviceability. Uh, there's, the, yeah, there's the PTC antenna that's used today. You'll see these around the railroad as you're you know, driving around, and, and especially at signal locations. So it's just a monopole, and there's two little loop antennas at the top. They operate in a 220 megahertz band. Um, it's all data, so even if you tuned into that frequency, you wouldn't hear anything. Uh, but there's a detail that if you're modeling contemporary railroads, you would have that on, on your layout to uh, suggest what era you're modeling. <coughs> so modeling the details on your equipment, if you're modeling the 1800s, you probably wouldn't have any type of antenna equipment on your locomotives and your cars. But you would have telegraph wires along the side of the track. Moving into the uh, early 1900s, same thing because the railroads hadn't yet adopted uh, onboard wireless radio equipment. It was still uh, telegraph. Towards, and you know, if you model in the 1940s and 50s, you certainly can correct me if I'm wrong, but towards the 40s and 50s, as telephone uh, became more popular for dispatchers talking to station agents, then the telegraph started to phase out because they didn't need to pay the extra on a uh, code operator, a telegraph operator that could use the Morse code key that required a, a skill level. Anybody can answer a phone and write down the orders. So they started to phase that out with the advent of telephone service. So that, that suggests what area you're modeling on your layout. As we move in towards uh, the 60s and 70s, uh, you would have base station type antenna uh, structures on the side of your main line, as well as a firecracker type antenna uh, on your cabooses and your locomotives. As we move into the uh, late 90s and early 2000s, now we start seeing more antenna on top of the locomotives for uh, maintenance tracking, uh, computer diagnostic equipment, that they're able to actually monitor the performance of a locomotive remotely from the locomotive shops. A lot of that's done with either GPS or um, cellular type technology. And uh, so you'd start seeing that, that equipment uh, show up on top of your locomotives. Also, with no cabooses, uh, there'd be no caboose to have an antenna on, but you would have the uh, EOT, which would require the antenna that would be up on top of the locomotive. To my experience, I have yet to see a manufacturer, I don't believe I've seen any put the EOT locomotive antenna uh, on the model, not to my experience. Although Details West does make that in HO scale, I don't know about the other scales. But there's a detail if you're detailing the rooftop of your locomotive that adds a bit of uh, you know, air placement for your layout to be able to have an idea of what, what area you're modeling just by looking at your pictures. Uh, base antennas, you can have that on you know, nearly any air from the 50s on to today. Uh, there's not too many manufacturers that make base type antenna towers. But if you did, 
It'd be really neat to have those painted in safety orange and white and have your blinky red strokes so that weighing arms don't knock them down. Uh, when you're in your model railroad, does anybody here have a model railroad that uses like radios for their layouts? Okay. So what's typical of a model railroad lay, lay, uh, layout is a, a standard FRS radio right here and a headset. And we'll explain why the headset's important here in just a minute. Um, if you're modeling and you're wanting to have your communications uh, mimic what era you're modeling, if you're modeling in the 1940s and 50s, maybe you would have a, a telephone handset on the side of your fascia on your layout. If you're modeling in the early 1900s and uh, late 1800s, uh, I don't know Morse code. I've attempted to learn, but I don't know it. <laughs> and I don't, I, I've yet to meet a model router who does, but if you really wanted to be accurate with your operations and uh, as to the standpoint of what area you're modeling, you could have station agents and have them, te have them learn uh, Morse code and actually send uh, Morse code from the dispatcher out. It's just another aspect of model rarity. You'd be surprised there's people out there that probably would enjoy that. Uh, but modeling in, in contemporary rarity, say 1960s on, since the real railroads would have been using wire, or, you know, portable radio setups, then it's okay to do that in our model railroad as well. Uh, the two options you have primarily today for like a walkie-talkie style device is FRS radios, family radio service. You can pick those up just about anywhere. Um, from Menards to Walmart to Amazon to eBay or wherever. And they're all pretty well interchangeable because if they work on standard channel assignments by the FCC. The other option would be CV, although the popularity of portable CV walkie-talkies is diminished. And, uh, I don't know of anybody that's using those right now. But it is important to use headsets, and uh, I'll demonstrate that, why. And some of you may already know if you've ever been on a layout with, uh, with radios. If you gentlemen would help me out so kindly. And talk to each other. Break it, break it. <laughs> Hello, Dave. Hold your radio a little bit closer to you. Yeah. So the feedback, if you've ever been in a, an environment where you everybody's got a walkie-talkie, nobody wants to wear the headset because maybe it's uncomfortable. And then you end up with a lot of that, and the dispatcher's in his room doing his best to yeah. still have hearing when he's done. <laughs> uh, so the headsets are important, and if you want to buy your own headset versus wearing somebody else's for uh, the purpose of uh, hygiene and whatnot, um, we, uh, we sanitize ours at our layout. Uh, I think we've got eight radios and ten headsets just to have some spares, and everybody gets one. Although we do have operators that don't like to wear it, and then we're stuck with listening to uh, feedback all night. Uh, oh, all right. I thought that was going to go a little bit longer than it did. Uh, so portable radios have gotten a little bit smaller over the years. This is my personal radio that uh, is the same model type that the railroads use. And uh, that's what somebody would have used in the 1980s. So a little bit smaller and a little bit lighter, a little more sleek, a little more functional. This has no display, whereas mine has a display. Uh, I don't have a locomotive clean cab radio to bring. A friend of mine has one, I could have borrowed it, I just didn't have the opportunity to do that. The locomotives have a very specific type of locomotive radio that's about that big square. Um, they're extremely heavy, but they're designed to withstand a derailment and still work uh, to call for help. Um, and they, they call those clean cab radios. You really wouldn't model that in model railroad because they'd be inside the cab with the crew. Uh, does anybody have any questions for me? Yeah, you mentioned the 220 and the list box. Yes. Frequencies did they use and what modulation method did they use? All right, so uh, early on it would have been AM. Uh, during the 1930s, the uh, experiments that BNL would have done would have, now, any voice communication back then would have been AM, either upper sideband or lower sideband, if it was sideband or uh, full, full modulation AM. Uh, towards the 40s, uh, military was experimenting with FM modulation on their on their frequencies, and that really saw a major use in the 1950s, especially with taxi cab companies, police departments. Uh, they started adopting FM because of its clarity. Uh, 
So this, all, all of these radios that I've brought operate in FM mode. Uh, the frequencies they would have operated on, I don't know when the AAR, which stands for American Associ or Association of American Railroads, I don't exactly know when they adopted their band plan, but they have a channel assignment that is universal in North America, so Mexico, Canada, and the United States, and every railroad radio is supposed to have that channel assignment in there where no matter what locomotive you've got, if you're on channel 32, you're going to talk to everybody else on channel 32. What's actually in these radios? Couldn't tell you. Didn't turn them on to, to find out. Uh, they're more than likely crystal controlled, so I could open them up and look at the crystals to see what channels. And uh, that's some of the disadvantage to uh, some of the older equipment. This radio here only has two channels. Probably a yard radio, you'd never leave the yard with it because you wouldn't have the channel to use on, uh, on the road frequency uh, to communicate with the dispatcher and the other trains. As the radios got newer, they were able to have more channels stored in them. Then as we got into synthesized transceivers um, using transistor equipment versus crystallized radios, then we could have the entire band plan, the entire channel assignment in every radio because then it was just a matter of memory storage in the, uh, the circuitry versus individual crystals for each channel. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll go with the gentleman in the maroon shirt. Um, in the mid 50s, mid 60s, um, I'm not doing Pennsylvania because I never liked those spines going down the <laughs> locomotive. But, um, I've always hated <laughs> those. Um, you're saying the, that firecracker antenna would be, and I mean, the locomotives say radio equipped, the cabooses say radio right. equipped. So they would have that firecracker antenna sitting there somewhere? Could be. Okay, and I'll explain why. Because that's when it started to, to be phased in. Um, so most of the equipment didn't come with that from the manufacturer, EMD uh, or ALCO. They wouldn't have been delivered with that equipment already installed. If the railroad would have installed it in there, it would have been when the locomotive came into servicing and they would have said, oh, we need to go ahead and upgrade that uh, to radio communications. Um, so that, it may or may not be. Towards the mid-60s to 70s, yeah, the equipment was being delivered with it standard, and that would have been a firecracker type antenna. Uh, so it just depends. You could put some on there, and it would be plausible. Now, on the caboose, so if you look at uh, the Southern Pacific in particular, cotton belt, on the caboose, look like a little flying saucer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, was, that would be a ground plane for a whip right. antenna, yep. and they did that for interference reasons by mounting the antenna directly to the metal body of the caboose, not only is it a great ground plane, it's a great uh, receptor for interference too. So by having that, that ground plane dish with the whip antenna on top of that, they were able to mitigate a lot of that without sacrificing performance. Uh, you had a question. Oh, I was just interested about the uh, firecracker uh, antenna. But uh, I think I'm gonna go back and research some of the photographs of the okay. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Rich. Is there one spot you'd go to to look up the various radio frequencies that the various railroads use? Or? Uh, well, I mean, really, a Google search would bring it down. Today's band plan includes, I'll give you a simple answer, in the United States, 90 channels. Uh, there's an extended band plan that includes the new digital channels that virtually no railroad is using, but the FCC has made the assignment so that as technology progresses, they're ready for that. They don't have to go back and make a lot of changes then. I guess the question is like, if you'd like to listen to the UP around here, yes. is there something that tells you what frequency they operate on? Probably the, the best database that I am familiar with, with, and this goes for any radio frequencies and for any standard you have, uh, would be radioreference.com. It's free information, uh, it's searchable by state and county. And then uh, railroads are usually assigned by state, so then you go to the state and then go to uh, railroads for that state. And that is user updated. So the information on there is subject to volunteers researching that and then posting that information. Uh, set, uh, just to, to one more point to that, most scanners have the ability to uh, do an entire search of a bank. And if you have a police scanner, you can either, some of them have pre-programmed railroad banks and you can just push a button and it will just monitor the railroads, but when you do that, you're monitoring the entire bank. When you really just want one channel, say Union Pacific on the Jefferson City sub, 
uh, in Pacific and you just want to listen to the Union Pacific trains, uh, it's easier to do the research and find just the channel they're going to use there. Now they typically don't change those channels because once uh, everybody in the territory is familiar with those channels, uh, they don't change them because what happens if somebody missed that memo and then you've got train A on channel 1 and train B on channel 2 and it's a potential for a miscommunication. Uh, the automatic, the automated train control that's coming to prevent the collisions and stuff, is that going to be a separate installation in the locomotives? So a lot of that's coming on with uh, like PTC. Train yeah, so, Sorry, so that's, that, that's already, a lot, a lot of the newer engines are already coming equipped with that uh, technology. Wabtec, I believe, is the, the company that's making the actual uh, transceiver uh, devices that go inside the nose of the locomotive. And they're all run up to those antennas that uh, they call them antenna farms now on top of the locomotive because there's just so many of them up there. And they all work together but do something different. So you have to have them all or none. And uh, so a lot of the older locomotives are being retrofitted with them. And that's where, as far as the details go, if there's any rivet counters here that have to have a specific placement on the locomotives, uh, if it came from the factory, it was probably standard. If it was done by a locomotive shop or a car shop like DeSoto, whoever was working that day, let's put it here. Okay, let's put it here. Now let's put this antenna on here and this antenna on here. And, and they would have pulled an antenna off of one locomotive and put it on a different one. Why? Because maybe that locomotive was getting scrapped or they said that antenna wasn't performing so they pulled it off and put a new one on and then threw it on the shelf and the next guy didn't get the memo and took it and stuck it back on that locomotive. Hmm. So when do you hold operating sessions? At, at, oh, so my friend's layout is a basement size layout and uh, the radio is really coming handy there because it's so large. Well, and I'll our, sign up for an operating session. Absolutely. We'd love to have you. It's, it's a three-hour drive, though. <laughs> Where is that? At Flora, Illinois. Flora? Flora. Flora. Flora, Flora Illinois. And, um, and I can give you a link to our YouTube video to show you uh, how we operate everything. And our dispatcher works in a dispatcher room with this base radio, and then all of our operators have the FRS radios with the headsets, and they're all over the basement running. Could you give an example, like commands from like your dispatcher on your layout? I'm not. What is it? Like the example. Examples of. Uh, Transmission. I brought it with me, and that was the slide that was missing. There's supposed to be audio right there, and it didn't load. So let me. Hopefully the audio comes through.
Hey, UPS has track warrant number 178, 178 dated September 20th, 2017 to the UP 1618 1618 at North Golden Gate. Xbox 4, work between North Golden Gate and Mud Junction on the main, MAI in track. First 178, 178. Okay, it's back to the 2018 201800 hours, two passenger days, and I'm over. Uh, track warrant 178, Xbox 4 from North Golden Gate, Mud Junction on the main track. Located at 2182018 So there is an exchange between myself and my friend John Means. He's a professional railroader and he comes to play the little trains with us a couple times a year uh, to show us how it's really done. And so a lot of what we've learned over the years in operations has come from him and some of the friends he brings with him. And so that's where, when you, when you hear us rattling off stuff like that, it sounds really fast, but like anything, you, you start to pick it up kind of quick, uh, and then it becomes second nature. So that was an exchange of him playing dispatcher and me playing engineer, uh, me receiving a track warrant authority to proceed down the branch line and uh, him having a copy of that on his computer. And uh, the exchange taking place using our uh, portable radios and headsets. And he's actually in another room in the basement, so uh, without those radios, then uh, we wouldn't be able to do it because I don't think anybody would want to install a telephone system. <laughs> is uh, misconception on my part, I understood that the uh, engineer had to repeat exactly what the dispatcher in, in real rarity, yes. In model rarity, there's some leniency to that. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and to address that point, actually, it depends on the railroad. Uh, I know that Union Pacific, uh, it's called a mandatory directive, and it, they require verbatim, word for word, repeated. Uh, whereas Eastern railroads, uh, specifically Norfolk Southern, I've heard them give an exchange and not give it verbatim, and they don't, they're not uh, hit on their efficiency test with that. So. It must not. It must. It depends on the rule. Uh, depends on the railroad. And we all we all just have fun, anyways. Do you do the investigation when we have a head on? <laughs> <laughs> don't don't laugh. I've been on the railroad uh, up in Minnesota where they had a head on, and the guy actually killed the power on the whole layout. Everybody came to a stop because they had to figure out it was in, in a single track area and they uh -huh. had a head on yeah. and the guy uh -huh. went back in there and okay let's see what your order says <laughs> see what your time says so it was all good the investigation usually comes to me because uh, our main line runs with ctc signal system and I've programmed that, and so if a cornfield meet happened, two things happen. Either one, I programmed it wrong. Yeah, it's a programmer. Yeah, and it, typically it is. Or two, they didn't see the signal and they ran right by it. And I have not yet, I've threatened to institute PTC on a model road, but it hasn't happened yet. Good job. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And if you want to come up and pick up any of this stuff, by all means, come and put your hands on it. And, uh, I can tell you more about it if you want to look. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming. Our sign up sheets are up here for the two trips. Yeah. Uh, wants to get a last chance at that. Yeah. We'll get the meeting next month in uh, the Illinois side. Yeah. 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 No, we won't. Next month we'll be at the uh, Christmas party. Yeah. 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 Yeah.